All right, let's get right into it. The American Heart Association has just dropped its 2025 guidelines for CPR and emergency cardiovascular care, and trust me, it is a huge update. We're gonna break down the absolute must-know, practice-changing updates that are gonna affect what you do on your very next shift. And when I say huge, I'm not kidding. We're talking about 760 specific recommendations. This isn't just some minor revision, it's a complete overhaul that touches on pretty much every part of adult, pediatric, and neonatal resuscitation. It's a lot to take in. And that's really the million dollar question, right? With hundreds and hundreds of pages, the real trick is to cut through all the noise and lock in on the changes that are going to directly impact your moves at the bedside. And that's exactly what we're here to do. So we've boiled it all down into these six high yield sections. We'll kick things off with the big picture philosophy, then jump into BLS and ALS, cover what happens after you get a pulse back, tackle those really tough special cases, and then wrap up with the systemic changes that are reshaping how we even think about this stuff. Let's start with that big picture. First things first, let's talk about the new thinking, the new philosophy that's really driving all of these guidelines. You'll see the AHA is making a major push toward a more unified, more holistic way of looking at what it means to save a life. And here it is. This is the new philosophy in a single image. For the very first time, we have one single unified chain of survival. It doesn't matter if it's an adult, a child, in the hospital or out in the field. It's all one chain now. The message couldn't be clearer. This is all one continuous process, from trying to prevent the arrest from ever happening all the way through to long-term recovery and survivorship. So, with that big idea in mind, how does it actually change what we do with our hands? What's different in those first few absolutely critical moments of a resuscitation? Okay, this first one is a big deal in infant CPR. The two-finger technique, you know, the one we've all been taught for decades, is officially out. The data is just too strong now. It shows that it often just doesn't get you the compression depth you need. So the new guideline says to strongly favor the two-thumb encircling hands technique, or if you can't do that, the heel of one hand. Okay, this is a big one for BLS. That Heimlich first approach we've all had drilled into us, it's out. For an adult who is seriously choking, the new sequence is five firm back blows, then five abdominal thrusts. The evidence is showing back blows can actually be more effective. And hey, it finally makes the adult and pediatric guidelines consistent, which just makes sense. A small change, but it has huge implications. We've seen studies showing that women are less likely to receive public defibrillation than men. And one potential reason is hesitation about exposing a woman's chest. So the new guideline says it outright. It is reasonable to just adjust a bra to get the pads on correctly instead of fully removing it. It's a really practical change aimed at knocking down a barrier and improving equity. Okay, we've covered the basics. Now let's move into advanced life support and see what's new with our more invasive interventions. This is a really important point. There's a new hierarchy for vascular access. Now, we all know IOs are lifesavers, but some big recent trials have kind of tipped the scales. The data suggests that IV access is linked with a better chance of getting sustained ROSC. So the new recommendation is crystal clear. Try for an IV first. The IO is your go-to, essential backup if that IV fails or you just can't get it. The timing of epi and shockable rhythms like VFib or pulseless VTAC, well, it's been debated forever. The 2025 guidelines finally bring some clarity. The bottom line is this, prioritize what works best and do it first. That means high quality CPR and getting that first shock in are the absolute priorities. You give epinephrine after those first couple of shocks have failed to do the job. And speaking of shocks, if you're cardioverting someone in AFID or a flutter, the guideline is now telling us to go a little higher with the initial energy dose. Starting at 200 joules or more is now considered reasonable. The goal here is simple, make that first shock count and get them back into a stable rhythm more reliably. That experimental head-up CPR technique? The guidelines say it's not ready for prime time. Don't use it outside of a clinical trial. And finally, they've confirmed what many suspected, vasopressin just doesn't add any benefit over using epinephrine by itself. When it comes to pediatric advanced life support, the new watchwords are speed and quality. For those non-shockable rhythms like PEA or asystole, you've got to get that first dose of epinephrine in early. We're talking less than three minutes. And if you're lucky enough to have an art line, you now have clear blood pressure targets to aim for. A diastolic of at least 25 in infants and 30 in children is what you need for better neurologic outcomes. 
And for newborns, the standard of care has made a huge leap. Immediate cord clamping is out. The recommendation now, for both term and preterm babies who don't need immediate help, is to wait at least 60 seconds before clamping. The evidence on this is so clear. This simple delay makes a real difference in outcomes. Getting a pulse back is a massive win. But as we all know, the work is nowhere near done. So let's see what's new in the world of post-cardiac arrest care. The core ideas of post-RSC care are still there, but with a renewed focus on avoiding hypotension like the plague, so we're still targeting a map of at least 65. One key update, though, is how long we do temperature control. Whether you're cooling or just preventing a fever, you should now maintain that for at least 36 hours to give the brain the best possible protection. And there's also a new emphasis on using broad imaging, like a head-to-pelvis CT and POCUS, to hunt down the reason for the arrest. Okay, this is a really interesting new tool in our toolbox. Neurofilament light chain, which is a serum biomarker, is now officially recognized as being valuable for prognostication. Now, it's not a crystal ball, but when you use it as part of a full picture, along with EEG, imaging, and your clinical exam, it can give you some really powerful data to help you and the family understand the likely neurologic outcome. All right, now let's talk about some of our most challenging, high-stakes scenarios. The new guidelines give us some much-needed clarity for these really complex arrests. For a cardiac arrest in a pregnant patient, the guidance is more direct than ever. The clock starts the second that arrest is recognized. Your team needs to be moving toward a resuscitative delivery, that's the new term for a perimortem C-section, and the goal is to have that baby delivered by the five-minute mark. And remember, this is not just for the baby, it's absolutely critical for the mother's survival too. We've all felt that hesitation about doing compressions on a patient with an LVAD, right? We worry about dislodging the device. Well, the 2025 guidelines cut right through that fear. The new rule is simple. If the patient is unresponsive and you think their perfusion is impaired, you do not hesitate. The benefit of CPR is way, way bigger than the theoretical risk. Start compressions immediately. And with the opioid crisis, this clarification is just vital. If you have a patient in cardiac arrest from a suspected opioid overdose, the number one priority has not changed. High quality CPR with good ventilations. Yes, absolutely give naloxone but under no circumstances should fiddling with a vial and drawing up naloxone get in the way of starting or continuing life-saving CPR. CPR always comes first. Finally, the guidelines really zoom out, looking beyond just the single patient encounter. They're looking at the systems, the ethics, and the science of education that supports everything we do. And some of these system-level changes are huge, they're now recommending public access to naloxone right next to the AEDs. For us, in our teams, they're endorsing both those immediate hot debriefs right after a code and the later, more formal, cold debriefs to improve the whole system. They're also pushing for tech like feedback devices and even VR and training. And critically, they're calling for family presence during CPR to be encouraged and supported by official hospital policy. And this quote right here really gets to the new ethical heart of the 2025 guidelines. This isn't just a suggestion, it is a call to action. The AHA is putting it in black and white. As healthcare professionals, we and our organizations have an ethical duty to actively find and fix the structural problems and social factors that lead to huge disparities in who survives a cardiac arrest. You know, when you step back, this whole update is really pushing us to think beyond just getting a pulse back. It's challenging us to look at the whole journey, from preventing the arrest to ensuring a good quality of life for survivors, and to see all of it through a lens of equity and justice. So the real question these guidelines leave us with is this. How are we going to take all this new science and use it to redefine what a successful resuscitation, a truly good outcome, really means for our patients, for their families, and for all of our communities?